welcome to Bob Up Submissions Live. It's an old school show today with two of our most enduringly popular guests from New Zealand, where it's currently crazy o'clock in the morning. I'm delighted to welcome back multi award winning author Woo-hoo! Lee Murray. Yes, and who better to pair up with Lee than our very own Ali Gardner? Yeah. <laughs> A very strong panel, I think you'll agree. But there's more, because I'm going to stop the show right here for a news flash. It's just been announced that Lee has won the New Zealand Society of Authors Laura Solomon Cuba Press Prize 2023. Many congratulations, Lee, from all of your fans here at Pop Ups. We're going to find out more about this right after today's first submission. Here we are, submission number one. Here's the title, Interdimensional. Interdimensional. First impressions, please, do you like that? It's YA, light sci-fi slash magical realism. And it's from Leah. And you've got a QR code there too, so that will take you to Leah's website. If you're on YouTube at the moment, Leah, say hello. Give us a give us a wave, please. We always like to, uh, to know that our authors are with us. Um, here's Leah's blurb. An adventure that's out of this world and dimension. After learning that things are not as they seem, Stella must embark on a journey with her best friend Cole to save the world as she knows it, as well as another one she's only beginning to understand. Let me tell you about Leah. Um, my previous experience includes a, de- a bachelor's degree in psychology and a minor in English writing, as well as a master's degree in clinical mental health counselling, with a specialisation in the expressive arts. Oh, that's a good background, isn't it? Uh, for my graduate programme, I chose to focus on creative writing as my primary modality. This psychology background allows me to portray the mental health difficulties the main character is facing in an accurate and non-judgmental manner. I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee, but I'm currently working as a therapist in Boston. Good. All right. Well, I'm delighted to say that uh, Ali, as uh, is, is commonly known, is also multidimensional because not only is she live with us on the show, but she also is our very first narrator. Interdimensional by Leah, read by Alison. You aren't eating. I didn't need to look up in order to know who'd just joined me at the cafeteria table. Cole was my best and pretty much only friend. he had transferred to Woodley High School in the middle of the freshman year. And since he hadn't known anybody, and I'd scared off all my other friends with some extremely long periods of antisocial behaviour, we'd gravitated towards each other out of a form of basic necessity. Why we had stayed together, though, I really couldn't say. Cole was athletic, self-possessed, one of the most caring people I'd ever met. In other words, pretty much everything I could only hope one day to become. He was always there when I needed him most, and he knew how to make me laugh when I felt I was going to scream. He'd seen me at my worst and offered comfort in response, not the judgment and criticism I'd initially feared he might. Cole and I had first met each other nearly four years ago, just a couple of months after the death of my father. Since my mother had hardly been able to deal with her own grief at the time, and there was nobody else who I'd feel comfortable talking to about it, I had learned to rely almost exclusively on Cole for the emotional support that I so desperately needed. Nope, I mumbled, not even bothering to raise my head from the table. Not hungry, he asked. It would take too much effort to lift the fork to my mouth. Ah, that makes sense. I knew that he wasn't about to let the matter drop, so I sighed and sat back up, so that I could continue our conversation without being rude. I'd meant to look at Cole, but then I took note of what was sitting on the tray in front of him, and my attention was diverted momentarily. Although the pizza had simply looked soggy and greasy in the lunch line, all this talk about whether or not I was eating anything had left my stomach grumbling, and the slice in front of him somehow looked saucier cheesier, and overall far yummier than the ones I'd decided to pass on just a moment ago. Cole rolled his eyes when he caught me staring at his food. Go ahead, he said, sounding put upon but pushing the tray towards me anyways. Thanks, I told him sheepishly, feeling embarrassed yet grateful. 
I picked up the pizza, having to use both hands strategically to prevent the slice from drooping, and took a big bite from the pointed tip of it. Anything else I can get for you? Actually, I said, ignoring the sarcastic tone of his voice, now that you mention it, do you still have your notes from when you took that history class with Foreman last semester? It'll probably take some digging, but I can find them for you if you really want, he shrugged. What do you want them for? We have a test next Monday, and I thought I should just double-check to make sure that I wasn't missing anything. That's a lie, Cole accused. What do you mean? I asked, trying to sound offended. You're a straight-A student, Stella. Not any more, I reminded him, cringing to think of my most recent report card. And what does that have to do with anything, anyway? You take notes on almost everything. I am honestly kind of surprised you don't transcribe all our conversations or something, just to have them for future reference. Hilarious. I'm serious, Stell. What's going on? Nothing's going on. I just misheard a couple of the things she said during the lecture, that's all. You fell asleep in the class again, didn't you? No, I was resting my eyes. There's a difference. Cole ran a hand through his long brown hair, a telltale sign that he was frustrated. Are you still hearing things at night? I opened my mouth to lie, but quickly shut it again when I saw his expression. Hmm, interesting. Here's some interesting side effects there. Um, let me cut straight to the genius room. Wow, uh, people not hanging around. Um, taking from the top, um, title and blurb. James likes the title. The blurb needs a wee bit more. Um, Jeff says, hello, Jeff. Um, Jeff says, that's not a blurb. Uh, Matt, this blurb and title could apply to a lot of works. I, I find it's a bit generic too. Pump up what makes this unique. Pamela Joe says, title and blurb need to really bring up the psych part. That's what makes it stand out. David McGuire says, the title and blurb like a hook. Um, Johnny says, who did that? And we had an unexpected sound effect then. Sorry about that. It, will, it might happen again, actually, in a minute. I like speech as a starting line, says Claire. And Annie says, tiny bit too much backstory uh, for the first paragraph. Writing flows well, says Hannah. And James says, a lot of telling, nothing happening. Mm. And Claire also agrees, too much backstory. Let's have something happening. A-S-A-P. So, Lee, first reactions, please. Um, well, I like the idea in a YA of having um, some trauma. Um, so the starting from a starting from a start point where there's a, some upheaval in the in the character's life is a really good place for YA. I, it's just a great start place. So that is very classic. Um, and so definitely on the on trend for YA with the you know the school setting and the issue around you know. Um, the issue around pizza and 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 last night's notes and not getting enough sleep that sort of sounds perfectly you know on point except for i don't i'm not getting the the sci-fi or the magical realism or no. anything it just could be anywhere so i think the problem is that we, we we're expecting something and we're getting you know just a high school kind of i think the word pedestrian so we're just not quite getting what your intent is here um mm -hmm. leah and and i think that's that's you know part of it I, th I felt a bit of repetition and i don't know if that was maybe what the genius room was picking up sort of where you get a dialogue tag and then you get a gerund so you know he asked ignoring so you know you get the ing word just after the dialogue tag and that's Sort of, I heard that a few times, and that kind of just sometimes jumps out at me as being repetitive, and that mm. may have been the the reason people felt perhaps it was it was a bit sl slow. I, yeah. I I don't know, but I other, otherwise I think the writing was reasonably sound. I just don't. I'm not seeing the YA. I'm not seeing the no. the word intimate, interdimensional conjures something else. So um, I think this is a different story so far. Yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you, Lee. It may be silly o'clock in the morning for Lee, but my God, she's sharp still, isn't she? Yeah, amazing. Um, Claire <laughs> says, the food chat isn't the most exciting. Um, rolling age should be banned, says Johnny. And David, David Wise says, do I look at an interaction? Good. 
show character through that. And Matt says, we're drifting at lunch. We're not getting into Dimension or sci-fi, which is just what Lou would say, more well, fun. Uh, Annie uh, says almost the same thing, not getting sci-fi fantasy yet. Title not memorable, says Eva. Um, Pamela Joe says, maybe just start with his swiping his pizza. That tells us a lot. It does, doesn't it? Makes the other long-winded, inf makes the other long-winded info dump unnecessary um and claire says oh, i agree with this dialogue flows well what did you think ellie yeah i mean i agree it was, it was a um um comfortably written piece but what i didn't get was any spark you know i didn't really mm. feel i was as pulled you know grabbed by the throat and pulled into the story it was just you know it could have been my neighbors or anything happening any day and it's only really on the very last line that you get this foreshadowing and you know something is about to happen but yes. that was that was quite late and i mean i like there to be lots of dialogue because i do think that is it, it brightens things up but really you know if you boil down quite what's happening in that piece it really you know she eats somebody else's pizza and i agree i mean that gives a good you know, idea of comfort between the two two friends. They are like that, but there really was that major info dump, and I think you know that could have been two lines. You know, uh, you know, death of a parent. You know, yeah, some, only one person to turn to. You know, no wonder we were friends. I don't know how you'd phrase it, but you know, it could have been done so much more succinctly. Um, yes. Rather than concentrating on that so yeah. i think i know more about the pizza than i do about the main character you know <laughs> so yeah actually i think um a, a, a lot more tightening and, and possibly to start somewhere completely different you know yeah. perhaps, you know without waking up screaming because she had the dream again you know whatever i know waking up's not a great place to start often well um, but the, no. middle of, the middle of a terrifying dream or something it's a bit but, predictable but yeah um, to simply not exciting enough, okay. but it could be. Okay. Thank you, Ellie. Press your uh, your vote button, please. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see what else. The uh, genie I, I, always on top form. Doesn't matter what time of the day it is. Doesn't matter what the weather is. Writing's good, says Hannah, but this isn't gripping me. I think that pretty much sums up my own my envy at the moment. Um, Matt says, get the sense we'd have been better off starting with a quote, are you still hearing things? Yeah, that would have been interesting, actually. Yeah. Author can write, says Annie, but it's not starting in the right place, I'm afraid. How many times have we heard that? Let me just ask a little, little mini confab here uh, between our eminent panellists. So that's one of the most common reactions we get here on pop -ups. you're not starting in the right place or kind of linked with it, the, the author is writing themselves into the story. What can you do about that, mm. Lee? Um, well, you know, it's a, it's the trick of starting as close as you can to that inciting incident. So, so I, I tell this to my students, uh, you know, when I'm working with uh, who work on short story, you know, you start at the the last possible moment before the action starts. You know, mm. before that that uh, before that character has to make some you know crucial decision of whether they're going to accept the challenge or not. So, so um, and and it doesn't have to be very you know as close as you can, and so maybe. Maybe yeah, maybe straight to uh, you're not sleeping is is the right is the right um, advice here. Yeah, I think there's some always some very good advice in that genius room. Always is actually yeah. I don't need to show up really. Just plug in that genius room. There you go. Ali's vote. You've got a question actually from Leah. Very nice to have you with us today, Leah. Um, and you want to know? You said I think on YouTube from memory. It's coming up here again. I uh, do you have any suggestions for what to add to the blurb. Uh, don't add anything to the blurb. Uh, blurb should be as short as possible. They've got one function, just one function, that's all. And that's to uh, to take the, the reader to the next sales stage, the next stage in the sales process. They're, sell they're a selling thing. They're tiny. They're very short, should be very short. But they all they've got to do is to move me on to the next stage in the, in the sales process. So many times, probably the majority of times, um, writers think that a blurb has to be a mini synopsis and they agonise over what to put in. And that's just what you asked. Actually, what else should I put in? You don't have to. It's it's a question of just just getting you know putting the salt on the tongue, making me go. Oh, that sounds quite interesting. I'll pick it up. And if you sort of follow through the um, uh, the physical metaphor, let's not talk about ebooks, Mike, because we don't have time. If you follow through the the physical metaphor, okay, so you've got the title. You know, you pick up a, a book in the in the bookshop. If you're lucky enough to have bookshops these days, uh, you look at the back and you say, oh, that's interesting. And if a blurb works at that point, it will make you go like that into the book itself. If it works, if it doesn't work, you go, oh, okay, I kind of know the story, but I'm not interested in put it down. That's the only function the blurb's got to 
uh, to do. I did a sort of two and a half, three hour seminar that's free for uh, Latopians in the colony on that, which you might well be interested in. Let's look at the numbers. You got a very solid start there, 57. 57, I'm going to write that down. I hope you're pleased with that. I hope you're pleased with the feedback from the genius room there. Um, just freeze it. Um, watch the thing again. You can come out from behind the sofa. Watch the thing again and just freeze frame it every so often just so you can see what people are saying because no one else is doing this. This is live sentiment analysis. There's a lot of, a lot of people who wish you well but who are just reacting honestly to, to uh, your manuscript as they see it in real time. So it's, it's precious. It's really precious. Hopefully it's, um, it's useful to you. Now look at this. Look at this. There. Gosh. Um, I'm going to, going to read you part of this because it's, um, it's tiny uh, on, on screen, but it is. That is our, our Lee. And this is an announcement from the uh, New Zealand Society of Authors that Lee has won the Laura Solomon Cuba Press Prize for 2023. Fox Spirit on a Distant Cloud, Lee. Fox Spirit on, on a Distant Cloud. You started writing this during lockdown, and I'm going to guess, because I haven't seen it, it's not going to be published till next year. I'm going to guess it's possibly one of the most personal things you've ever written, is it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, it is. It looks at um, the um, Chinese diaspora in New Zealand and the untold stories of Chinese women, um, those kind of stories that that families sweep under the carpet, and it's a, a prose poetry collection. And I use the fox spirit, which is a which is a Chinese myth mythological creature. Um, mm. And distant cloud is a, is a, an allusion to um, New Zealand because the Maori word for New Zealand is the land of the long white cloud. Yes. So um, I go through the various lives of a fox spirit. A, a, and she shaped it shape shifts into these these women uh, from New Zealand. So yeah, it's very very personal, yeah, um, and, like... and uh, I didn't help writing it in in COVID either. So yeah, no, but I'm super super excited um, about the result. And Laura Solomon is in, is a is, is was a New Zealand poet and much loved, and she died very young, um, and so her family has put together this wonderful wonderful prize. So I'm very yeah. excited. So when you you were writing this in lockdown because it, it is very personal and, and it covers themes and topics that you've you've approached before black cranes tortured willows unquiet spirits um all of them dealing with the experience of the asian uh diaspora um so when you were writing this did you think oh, this is going to be so strange i'm never going to get it published yeah I so it was, it was writing for yourself <laughs> really it's prose poetry. Yeah, yeah, it was, and 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 I needed to do something different with it. You know, I needed it needed to be something unique. And oh, look, I I just struggled. I struggled with every word. So um, the fact that some other people have seen some merit in it is super Isn't brilliant. Isn't that to brilliant? Me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. I'm so pleased for you. Actually, it's just so nice when things line up like that. You know, just just written from the heart, not with the expectation it's going to be commercially successful, but just because you want to do it. And there you go. I mean, you know, your vision has been shared, it's been recognised. How brilliant that is! Uh, we'll talk to you more uh, in a moment about about this and indeed about all your other extraordinary uh, writing and, and prizes. But now I think we should look at submission number two. Thank you, Leah. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. You've got the message there, definitely. Here we go. The Emery Papers. Emery Papers? Is that sandpaper? Hmm. And the Emery Papers. Upper middle grade YA. Um, but Marie, you said, I'm not very confident after that. So I don't know if that's confident about the, um, the uh, readership. Or if it's just a general comment, because an awful lot, awful lot of aspiring writers are not very confident. We could talk about that in a minute, actually. I think Lee will have some things to say about that. Upper middle grade YA, it's from Marie, and this is Marie's book. Up the Institute, Magic Leaks. The library roams, and portals lurk in the cupboards, waiting for the wary. 
Fifteen-year-old Emery, oh, hence the Emery Papers, is a socially awkward, failing student who spends night after night tapping out tunes on light switches, that's different, and working out a plan to fix older sister Andy. Andy is Emery's hero. The first time Emery ever encountered bullying, Andy saved the day. And she continued saving the day right up until her own magic was severed. Now it's Emery's turn to step up. All, all about me. I'm a primary school teacher. I have a degree in creative writing. This is my first novel. Help, what else shall I say? <laughs> I can read in between the lines here. I've just started uh, sending out submissions to agencies. Most don't reply back. Oh, I'm sorry about that. On behalf of my uh, so-called profession, I apologize for that. The fact is, you know, they're swimming in submissions. Massive oversupply of manuscripts. But good ones do do jump out, actually. They they do. So I'm sorry you don't hear back, but don't don't be discouraged about that. We'll talk about that after after we've heard the submission. I've no idea if my writing is up to par or not. The genius room will tell you. Um I feel like it's decent. <laughs> Okay, getting quite internal here. I feel like it's decent, but it's hard to keep sending out with no real idea of whether I have a chance or not. Thank you for reading. I love what you're trying to do with this. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's very nice of you to say that. And I think you're going to love, because I do, this reading by Bev. The Emery Papers by Marie Madden, read by Bev. The canteen is laid out like a pie. Hordes of garish plastic chairs lead up to the centre of the room, where the serving tables bestow their wares. Actual living food servers haven't been seen here for years. Each mealtime begins with the long steel tables preloaded, and ends with an empty, save for a few desultory crumbs. A lack of staff proves no obstacle to the smooth running of mealtimes. The ceiling is festooned with bleach-white spotlights. I appreciate the searchlight effect. It means I can quickly scan for crawlers, and it highlights mood changes in the spouting condiments. Nobody seems to know why the condiments, or rather the condiment jugs, have developed an appreciation for rhyme. It's just one of those things. And during my ten months, three weeks and two days at Meerden's Institute for the Magically Inclined, I've grown fond of unadorned meals. Not so my fellow students, especially anyone with sensor talents. For a sensor, magic in the air gives off different tastes. Cheesy encyclopedia, minty cardboard, that sort of thing. Condiments are a big deal if you want to disguise them. Most people get an allowance to see them through their first months at the Institute. The majority of it goes on paying their way through the idiosyncrasies of day-to-day -day life here. For those with no allowance, student life is more difficult and less tasty. Alex Moore is a case in point. He sat at one of the red tables. The tables and chairs are colour-coded. Code's key is posted on every available surface for the first week of term and then it disappears. Like the Institute is saying, well, kids, that's all the help you're getting with your little social lives. Hope you've learned it off by heart. A while back, some social climber worked out that the table chair combinations can be mixed around to add a little extra social commentary. A few examples for your delight. Red table and orange chair equals, look at me. I'm the kooky one in my super popular gang. Or white table plus purple chair equals, I don't want to talk right now, but I won't tell you why, because I'm esoteric and mysterious. The combinations are endless, and it gets exhausting. Team Spirit, the only friends I've got in this place, we tend to plonk ourselves as far away as possible from the students who care about what colour chairs they're sitting in, and let them get on with it. Which made it odd that Alex was over there, sitting in a red chair at a red table. Red tables are for lively chatter. Their acoustics are excellent, and their matching chairs swivel for easy conversation and witty repartee. We don't very often sit at red tables, so the fact that the team were at one now, looking for all the world like those kids who are desperate to find a new friend, was a bit concerning. 
To be honest, most of what my friends do is a bit concerning these days. It didn't used to be, but then Andy lost her magic, Dad lost his mind, and now I'm losing my friends. We go way back, past MIMI, past primary school, all the way back to nursery. At least me, Alex and Mac all go that far back. Daniel Swift joined us in primary. His parents are travelling mages who set up for a while in town. Daniel just walked up to the three of us on the yard one day and announced, I'm picking you to be my friends, like he was presenting an award or something. Mac and Alex were all clapping him on the back of You've Got a Footy, Fancy a Kickabout, and I just did a teeny tiny little nod, very non-committal. But he clocked it and gave me one of his great beaming smiles, all shiny white teeth and hope for the future. And here we go. Sorry about those uh, additional boings there. Uh, I know it's going wrong, but I may not be able to fix it during the show. Um, so let's catch up with the genius room and Claire starts with my, my own, I should read my mind really, Claire starts, but Harry Potter, he does feel as if we're in that world, doesn't it? Uh, Jeff says the blurb, blurb does need tweeting, tweaking, I think, tweeting, tweaking, but it's interesting, makes me want to read on. Yeah. Um, and Lex, <laughs> famous, says, Lex, stop that right now. It's not Lex, actually. It's me on this occasion. Uh, and Fanna says, somebody feed that goblin. <laughs> so, it does sound like that. Uh, David Nguyen says, I'm in. This is a cracking start. Matt says, desultory and festooned are slowing you down. Nice start, but up the pace. Hannah says, the writing voice isn't middle grade. I'll pick that up too. It's too old. Uh, write like the kids talk. All senses engaged, says Pamela Jo. Well done. Claire G says, info dump. Uh, Dave McGuire, less exposition, please. Hannah, kids don't call themselves students. Mm. I want some action, says David. And James says, not sure why I will be hooked by this. Needs more action to hook him in. And Pamela Jo, you'll need to work hard to make clear you are not just doing Harry Potter fan fiction. I think that's true. Annie says, this has got a great voice. It has. But I think it needs a bit more action and less info dumping. A um, bit too much about the tables and chairs. Yeah. And Matt says, it's cool info you're dumping, but it's still slows you down too much and Pamela just said there's good, there's a lot of uh, good lot of world building in this like but <laughs> she's saying vomit draft again that's not not a criticism but this seems like the vomit draft now I know what that means um, the one you get the story out and then you begin to refine the storytelling yeah and Jeff says writing seems to be going off track needs to focus on the story a little less detail about red tables etc so we'll break at this point and see what Ali thinks um yeah i mean clearly written by somebody with a fabulous imagination there is just mm. so much going on but i did almost have the sense that i was watching a carousel all this stuff was flashing past me all this sort of interesting stuff and i didn't really have time to get a handle on any of it um, yeah. i mean we had all these names we had andy and alex and mac and daniel i hadn't really got hang of main character by that time and it's almost like Bootle, you know, you're kind of setting off and then suddenly we're in another little loop and then, you know, we carry on another bit and we're off in another loop. I think if, if some of these ideas can be pruned out to give us a clear idea of, of kind of where we're going and, and what, what the challenge is, you know, yeah. is she unhappy? I mean, you know, um, presumably maybe because she gave the time she'd been at the place in, you know, down to the last few days, you know, which either means she's having a fabulous time or terrible. Um, so I think just to give a much better sense of, of quite what's going on, quite what the challenge is, and, uh, but just without quite so much stuff going on. You know, yeah. it's, it's really difficult to know what to concentrate on, frankly. Um, yeah. so, Did you get Harry no, Potter think, vibes? Um, yes, to a certain extent, yeah. Um, but, um, but uh, yeah, um, yes, the, the magical vibes, but it's, uh, it just needs to be a lot clearer. I think the Harry Potter is actually quite a lot clearer of where it's going, as it were, and they're, yeah. they're much less ideas all, all kind of whooshed in at the beginning. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I think just not necessarily slow it down, but just take some of it out and maybe introduce it later. Um, so it is, it is being a stumbling block at the moment, isn't it? It's, it's obviously difficult knowing how much to conclude because you know you feel you've got to hmm. cover the basics and so on, but. Each time you do that, it's like putting a little roadblock in the in the way of the uh, the reader, yeah. Lee. Oh, look, um, I'm not sure about the title, Marie. Um, didn't quite. It sort of seems a bit more thrillery 
to me, so you might need to rethink the title. The blurb I absolutely loved. I would have opened the book straight away. I, I just loved it. Um, and I think there is still some place for Harry Potter type books. You know, kids love stories about I schools is, and magic. And yeah. So I don't know that that's really a problem. Um, and certainly the world building and the magic is just fantastic. They're so original and they're not anything like Harry Potter. So, you know, go for that. That's terrific. The problem is, and look, I absolutely love the first line. The canteen was laid out like a pie. I mean, I can just see that canteen. I am straight, straight there. What what we need next in the second line, Marie, is your character because I don't know who's talking. So get us straight into the second, into the head of your character in the second line, in the second sentence. And then from there, I want to see the scene. So I want to see Alex and Max and what have you choosing a chair and this is what happens if it's purple and I want to have them communicating and get your world building around the scene so and have something happen because you've got so much gorgeous world building I mean have the condiments do whatever they do be moody and you know um just you've got it all here you've got the magic here but I am not no I don't know what's happening I don't know what the what what the problem is where's the story so you've you've got you've got the characters they're there and you've got and you've got the backstory we don't probably need it yet and you've got the world building but where's the happening so it I think you've got the skills. I just it's just not quite there yet. And it's a little yeah. bit of the problem that we saw with Leah is that we're we're working ourselves into the story and we just need to get there sooner. It's so common that, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you, Lee. Um press your your buttons now. Yeah, please. I've just, it's it's the um, it, there we go. Okay. Um we've got um uh long comments here from Lex. Um, shine, uh, Ch- Chandler Jewel says, so Chandler Jewel says, shiny white teeth and hope for the future. Engaging. Um, Claire says, too much inter- internal monologue. I thought that's that's right too, actually. Mm. I think that can slow it down. Mm. Let's have some character interaction. Show us a scene. Uh, Pamela Joe, yeah, uh, uh, apropos uh, the vomit draft. Uh, yeah, Pamela Joe says, blame Tiffany Yates Martin, who also has another guest on the show for the, uh, for the V word. Uh, Claire says, Emery sounds very negative and rather depressed. And Lex says, the good, he often does this, actually, the good. I love, love, love the idea of magic having different sensory input values. I use it myself. However, the bad, this reads like author's notes, work all of this into a story. We don't need a wiki article up front about how everything works. And he's added the ugly. This needs more Lex. That's all stories. Yes, of course they do. I want to ask... Um, our distinguished panellists, um, who will be even more distinguished at the end of the show, I think, once they get through it. After all the, uh, the sort of verbal uh, farts, that are, uh, uh, the audio farts that are going on during each reading. I'm very sorry about that. I know what's going wrong. I'm able to fix it during the show. I may be able to. We had a lot of technical things going on behind the scenes the past few days, and clearly not all the, uh, the gremlins have been ironed out. I just want to pick up something that Marie said um, in her submission notes. I'm not very confident. And I don't know if that actually applies to the the genre she was talking about, or if it's a more general thing. And she's also talking about that she doesn't get any feedback from agents and so on. And I kind of try to explain that. But can we both say a few things about authorial confidence and how how to develop it, please? Can we start maybe with you, Ali? I, I think it, it's enough water under the bridge. I think if you do write quite a lot, then after a while you begin to to understand um, how words work and how sentences work. You just do get more confidence in in putting things on paper and making it sound like English, really. Um, Writing groups, I think, are really useful because, you know, offering it to your friends and family to comment is almost useless um, because they're bound to say nice things and you don't necessarily need that. But I think writing groups by people who genuinely understand how, how, you know, the whole grammar set up and, and how stories work um, yeah. and how rhythm works it is, is very helpful indeed. Um, and, uh, you know, reading it aloud again, I do think, you know, I know mm. it's been said many times, but again, I, I just do think mm. you can give yourself much more impression of, of how the whole thing is working. Yeah. So, uh, so it's just, it's just practice makes perfect. You, you grow in confidence I, I the more, the more you, you have do. To just, yeah, get yeah. a lot of words on paper and they will yeah. be better words by the end of it. Yeah, do you and agree? also chuck away the first three current chapters. Always oh, yeah. throw away the first three chapters. Absolutely. <laughs> Lee. Ah, 
I, I'm listening to Ali and I think that's really good advice and I, I don't know the answer because I, I still don't, I'm not very confident myself and every time I send something off I think this is rubbish and no one's going to like it and, you know, why, why did I even write this? And Please. so I understand totally, How Marie. Many have you I know, so no, far? I mean, it, it makes no difference. I, I'm worried that someone is. I'm, someone is going to find out that I can't yes. really do this. You know? <laughs> Imposter syndrome. Um, yes. I, I, oh, no. I mean, you know, that's I, awful, I, actually. I think, oh, that's yeah, very depressing. Think, if someone of your eminence feels like that, what hope is there for <laughs> you know, us mere mortals? Well, I think I think there's a tension, isn't it? And you need to keep striving to do the best possible writing that you can, and so get as many feedbacks as uh, much feedback as you possibly can, and then sort of stand back and look objectively at it. That's all really you can do, and just keep working at it, and and going to courses and coming to things like this to to try and get as much um, you know support and and an understanding. I think that, and one of the things you might do, Marie, is maybe go to some conventions and meet some publishers firsthand and practice pitching and um you know and and just say well you know what's the f get some feedback that way i think that's you know that often have pitching sessions and it doesn't matter if if it doesn't get through you can get some feedback about what you're doing wrong what your first you know what your what whether or not there's any appetite for what you're writing and and why how it might need to be different in order to get across the line that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Now, I'm going to, um, because this is a live show, and I don't want that horrible noise again, actually. I'm just going to do a little programming live on air. I know it's, it's kind of, it's it's not it's not very sensible to do we, that. But... We'll disappear in a second. <laughs> oh, no, I'm going to be, she's, he's going to throw me out of the session. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's quite possible. Me. Okay, so I'm just going to one change there. One change to one line of code, and I think that may have done it. Either that, or we'll never see each other again. Who knows? Um, Marie, if you're around, let us know if that was uh, no safe done. Absolutely right. Let us know if that was useful, please. Um, let's look at the numbers that you've got there. You've got 65. Now, you should be very pleased with that. 65 is a darn good score. And some months, people have actually won the month with, with the 65. So. That's not bad. Any final thoughts on the Genius Room? Lex says, I've got no problem with the story being like Harry Potter as long as the writer is not like J.K. Rowling. Oh, we're not going there. No, we're not. No wonder Lee wins all the prizes, said David. That's great advice. Isn't that nice, you see? A little bit of confidence boosting there. That's, you've got to do that, actually. A bit of mutual confidence. As always, says Matt, Lee is dead on. Give us a character to serve as a tour guide of your world. That's good. Um, Pamela Joe, geez, now I see Pete standing in a, a, a chintz apron in front of the board, ironing gremlins. I think I've got that one. We'll see in about 45 seconds' time. Uh, Chandler Jill's repetition leads to recognising and honing in on your voice and style. Um, and David says all this in live coding. Yes, well, we'll see. We'll see. Just one digit that I, I changed. Uh, my says P just didn't put the nuclear codes, didn't he? Again, we'll find out in a minute. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Here we go, so much number three. Here's another title for your delectation, at least for your um uh, for your decision, I suppose. Dead language. Dead language. Do you like that as a title? I think it's quite distinctive. It's, uh, again, it's YA, doing a lot of YA today. YA literary fiction. Oh, I'm not sure about that. YA literary fiction. Hmm, okay, that seems to have... In my own, um, you know, uh, sort of marketing mind, that's dramatically reduced the potential immediately, which I don't like, because uh, I've got to make money, haven't I? And you have too. Um, it's from Neve. And Neve's got a website there, a QR code, so scan that, go to it. Uh, meanwhile, I'll read you Neve's blurb. A bereaved Belfast teenager is uprooted from her self-imposed isolation and numbness and plunged into an overcrowded world of shame, blame and teenage rivalries at a Gaeltac summer college on the edge of the Atlantic. I like that. I can see that. She must learn to cultivate her past, concede the future and balance between the two to own her power in the present. That's a bit, bit neat and pat. It's a warm, light-hearted and funny parental loss story. Oh. <laughs> that's a 
if an oxymoron there. Uh, in a strange landscape that will appeal to everyone interested in the oddities of Irish culture. All about need. I've published essays in the Vacuum magazine, Freckle magazine. Oh, I, I didn't know there was one. What a lovely name for a magazine. Freckle magazine. Um, I was given the Prime Minister's Point of Lights Award for founding a charity. I've worked as a journalist, communications and PR specialist of 20 years, both in the USA and in Northern Ireland, achieving great success and reach. I have extensive skills in social media and traditional media communications. Good. Very useful, actually, for the uh, uh, self... Uh, not just for the self-published author, actually, for the author who's traditionally published, too. Very useful skills indeed. Um, I have a BA distinction in creative writing from Queen's University, Belfast. I've been selected for many high, highly competitive writer development programmes, including Northern Ireland Screen Short Steps, yeah. BBC Writers Room Hothouse, no, well. And Irish Writers Centre programmes have awarded funding to write this novel and my next one. Well, you're very fortunate to have that. But even more fortunate, I do declare to have this reading from Johnny. Dead Language Written by Neve Read by John Chapter 1 Esther! Esther lay motionless in her school uniform with her lips apart and her glazed eyes staring into space as if the last spark of life had just departed from her body. She knew exactly what that looked like. A draught from beneath her windowsill swept over her cheeks and stirred a strand of cobweb floating in the corner of the ceiling. Her name was being called in a voice that seemed very small and far away. Holding her breath, she ignored every interruption, every twitch, and willed her mind to melt into abstraction. If she stole her breath long enough some mornings, the outline of her body dissolved into the surrounding air. From the street below came the sound of front doors opening and shutting, vehicles starting up and lone dogs barking the streets away, and downstairs the voices of her dad and her little brother volleyed back and forth as they moved around the kitchen. The aroma of browning toast crept under the door, crept across her and gnawed at her stomach. Every smell, every movement, every sound charted her edges and pulled her back within her body. Esther, get up! The dead air in her lungs let out and she gasped, filling her rib cage, whacking her arms down on the duvet in frustration. She pulled herself up against the headboard, frowning grimly at the four blank walls of her room. It was a magnolia cube. No paintings, no posters, no photos, nothing on the shelves. She could have been anywhere. Everything she owned remained boxed up and shoved in the back of her closet, as if this was a temporary place, as if she was in the process of moving in or moving out. It was almost as clinical as her granny's care home. Her bedside clock blinked 8.15am. There was less than an hour until her session with Mr Gleason that her dad thought would iron out all her problems, and as a consequence, his. Esther! Her dad roared up the stairs. If I have to come up there and drag you out of bed feet first, I will. I said... Esther shouted at the bedroom door, speaking for the first time that morning. I'm coming! Through the thin wall, one of the neighbours cursed, stomped across the floorboards and thumped on the bricks a few feet behind her headboard. Esther stuck two fingers up to the wall, then moved around the bedroom, opening and shutting drawers, dragging things across the floor. More delaying tactics. She didn't know why she wound her dad up like this every morning, nor could she stop it. When finally she entered the kitchen... Oliver was playing Minecraft on his tablet and spilling milk all the way from the cereal bowl to his mouth. Esther wiped his chin with her sleeve. Look out for the creepy guy, she said, touching a character on the screen. Stop it, Esther, he said, pushing her away. You're making him attack. Their dad was standing by the cooker grumbling. He glanced at Esther in disgust, typed a message on his phone and slipped it into the pocket of his iron shirt. His eyes were puffy and his face crumbled and the pocket was already stained with coffee. What's eating him? Esther whispered. Oliver giggled and they both watched as their dad crammed butter onto the toast and dumped porridge into two bowls. He pushed one bowl across to Esther and sat down, breathing slowly, tapping the end of his spoon on the table. He glanced at her a few times and placed a spoon alongside his bowl, working himself up into some sort of confrontation. Esther shoved a massive heap of porridge into her mouth. Esther, I'm going to forget the fact that I called you to get up more than five times this morning and that you've kept me late for work again. I'll forget about that. Doesn't sound like you're forgetting about it, Esther mumbled through this porridge. Can you just give me a break here? There's something important we need to talk about before you go to Mr Gleason this morning. Uh, 
Oh, we cut straight to the genius room. I got rid of one of the audio files, not all of them. Um, and incidentally, the numbers you see there were incorrectly referenced. We do have the right numbers, but the ones on the screen were not correct. So I'm sorry about that, but they will be. It will be next week, certainly. Um, Pamela Jo says, uh, ask an interesting question, actually, which we will talk about um, after we've finished discussing this submission um, about the best you want to break into. Matt loves the title. The blurb wanders and isn't story focused. Um, David says that blurb starts with a 36 word sentence. Mm. Makes me feel like this will be hard work to read. Dead language sounds like nonfiction to me, says Hannah. Um, James says, interesting title. Not sure blurb would hook YA. Um, Pamela Jess says, YA. Claire says, doesn't sound lighthearted. That's uh, a remark that's been echoed several times. Chandra Jules, blurb is vague and wordy. Dave Noir has a little ditty. Latin's a dead language, as dead as dead can be. It killed off all the Romans, and now it's killing me. <laughs> That's an old one, David, but good. Um, Oddities of Irish culture, says Hannah. You're speaking to an Irish person here. And... No stakes, says Claire, but that's literary fiction for you. Yeah, you see, I wonder about that. You can cover a lot of sins with that uh, moniker, can't you? Good ideas here. Lux uh, goes on to say, rework that blurb and show us what you've got. I want to know how to pronounce for moi. Obscure language in jokes. Yeah, hell of an opening paragraph, says David M. Claire G, she knew exactly what that looked like. Good line, poignant. Um, and Pamela G says, oh dear, waking scene. Like the sensory description, Hannah says, writing's good. And Johnny, our narrator, says, I really enjoyed this. Fine voice. Fine voice, Lee. Yes, I thought Johnny's voice was fine. <laughs> um, uh, Neve, this is, look, I, I'm intrigued by this. I'm also suffering now even more so from imposter syndrome because you are better qualified to write than I am. Oh, um, no. <laughs> but I, yeah. Um, I, I, as soon as I saw Dead Language, I went straight back to my Latin lessons as well. So I, I don't know if that's what you intend. Um, I don't even know if they teach Latin in schools anymore. I, I have no idea. I mean, um, they do but some, I'm yeah. not quite sure. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure about that title. It doesn't give me that Irish feel. Um, but uh, And the blurb, I think, is a mix of, you know, I'd like to know who the character is. It's just this somebody. Um, mm. And then it seemed very formal. And then suddenly it said, it's lighthearted. And say, that was very incongruous. Uh, if, it, if, you, if it's lighthearted, write the blurb in a lighthearted yeah. way. Um, yeah. so, so the blurb should still give us a feel, the mood, the tone um, of the story. So that needs a little bit of work. I, I think someone said that it started with waking up, and, and yeah. I think Ali very clearly said, don't start with waking up. Yeah, but no, I go. did like the interaction between Dad and, um, and the character, um, Esther. You could have started with the last paragraph, uh, you know, I've, I've told you to get up this many times and, you know, mm. and, well, you know, I, I love this, the talking back. That was fantastic. Were, I could just imagine my kids doing that in the day. Uh, um, so I think it, there, just uh, everything was, uh, I just think you need to start later and closer mm. to that, you know, inciting incident. We were in the last three lines, I think we got Mr. Gleason and we got that there was a problem between them. I did like the nice little interaction between the, the, the brother and sister, but you know, I don't. I don't know. I think we. I think we're just working our way into the story again. It's just yeah, that same are. problem. We are. Yeah. Um. This this week. So. Um, but the writing is very competent. Yeah. Yeah. It is competent. Um. Coming back to the uh, genie eye, Annie says, "I'm enjoying this, but agree on the formatting." Jeff says, "I like this. It's engaging. There's a good voice, but we need to move on with the story." General reaction here, isn't it? Actually, uh, Neve, it's um. Uh, we, we just want you to go on and enjoy the writing. Uh, Johnny, our narrator, says, love the writing. Very real and parental conflict established. Certainly, Matt says, I'm not sure why our audience sees enough here to keep moving. Mm. 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 Uh, Hannah says, again, author writing stuff in the story. Yeah. Uh, perhaps start with the first day at the Gale Tax School. That sounds interesting, actually. Everyone is supposed to speak Irish Gaelic there all the time. Really, I didn't know that. Will that be isolating for? Of course it will be. Yeah, very, very interesting, that. Oh, I, totally. Chandra, Chandra Jules, writing's engaging, not light-hearted, hooked, hooked by the character. Agree with Hannah, says Annie. Starting at the school seems like the right thing to do, or with her finding out she's going there. Yeah. 
Um, uh, Lake says Latin's no longer taught. It's been replaced by Rongo Bongo and Linear B. <laughs> by me, so I can laugh at people. All right. Parallel universe time there. Ali. Um, I agree about the title. It, it didn't kind of grip me and it didn't really tell me what, what was about to happen. I don't know. Maybe, you know, if, if there are bad things happening, something, a dying language or I don't no. know. I mean, I'd like short titles, I think, can often be very snappy, but it just didn't take me anywhere. Um, yeah. Again, with the blurb, I, I, you know, it should have been cracking, you know, a lighthearted death story. <laughs> you know, you've got me. Um, yes. <laughs> but the whole of the blurb was completely serious until it told me it was lighthearted. Mm. You know, it informed me rather than actually being lighthearted. And likewise with the piece itself, you know, there really wasn't anything that I would have thought was remotely even slightly amusing in that lot. Um, at the beginning, I was slightly confused where we were. I didn't know whether we were going into some magical realm or whatever. And then it became clearer that it was simply her effectively experiencing death, you know, clearly somebody mm. close. Um, and so it was a very emotive piece. And it did make you feel that a child should not be feeling that way, should not wish to experience that. So there was, there was quite a sort of emotional tug on that one. But yeah. I think there's lots of her explaining. I mean, the room being a magnolia cube, that's all I needed. You know, it's kind of, mm. it's there, you know, it's, it's a blank room, you know, and perhaps everything's, you know, all my stuff is packed in the cupboards would have been fine. But again, we had a whole paragraph to explain what the Magnolia Cube looked like. Um, so I think debulking some of that. I thought we, we had a very good sense of the relationship between her and her father and her and the brother. That came across really well in the dialogue and, and their actions. Um, but I entirely agree that there was nothing really much happening. Yeah. Um, I think. I think starting closer to something actually. And you happened. can't. You see that that you can't hide that simply by saying, "Well, it's literary." No. That's the thing, no. isn't it? It's, yeah. I, mean, I literary, think it is. It's right. literary. It should be more compelling, really. Yeah, and to choose that title for yourself to call it literary, I think is. It's almost like you're you're going to dress it up in, you know, you're going to make it slower and dress it up in fancy language. I think, you know, calling it literary yourself is perhaps a difficult road. It, it is. It I, I always, I always, <laughs> yeah, I always, I always say, let, let's, let other people call, call your work literary. I'm yeah. sure people do, do, do with Lee, but, you know, I mean, from the agent's point of view, sort of, you know, it's only submission and saying literary, saying, oh, I'm not yeah. going to sell anything. So, no. Um, it's a quality... It's a quality of the writing. It's not um, not a genre. Um, I, okay, so I just want to say one more thing actually about the um, yeah. I don't. I don't feel there's a hook here, um, no. and I I need to get more deeply involved with the words here in the and you know sometimes people talk about pace and speeding things up, um, and I think. You don't need to change the pace, but I think you do need to do what I say too often, probably, to people in the huddles here, which is I want, I want you to get more meaning out of your words. And if, if, okay. you, if you reduce... It was what you just said, actually, Ali, about debulking. I just wrote, wrote that down, because I think that's a great word to, to describe it. If you just, yeah. just take out all the words that are not working as hard as they could do... You know, and you may only be taking out five, ten percent of something, but you'll be amazed at how much it tightens things. Actually, I think that's the the next stage uh, for for you. Let's look at uh, no, let's. We've got more comments in the um, genius room. Um, I've got so many comments in the genius. My goodness me. Uh, Dave McGuire says, "I rarely give five out of five a craft. I did this time." I did this time. That's brilliant, isn't it, actually? Um, mm. Hannah says, there are a few places in the west of Ireland where Gaelic is their first language. There's a movement to promote it. Two films have been uh, released recently in Gaelic. Dead language doesn't really fit. Um, and Pamela Jo says, it would be an unpopular view that Irish is a dead language, if that's the topic. Um, but Claire says, mm. dead could also refer to the dead parent. And Dave McGuire said, don't tell me you're funny, tell me a joke. Yeah. Uh, maybe one of the characters have that misconception and or wordplay on the death of the story. Um, Pamela just said, uh, co Ali covered all the bases, bullseye on all points. I second everything she said. In which case, I shall shut up and look at the numbers here. Those numbers are correct. You've got a 64 there, Neve, which is a hair's breadth away um, from, let me just write that down, a hair breadth away from submission number three, but we also now have submission number four, which could topple everything. <laughs> Submission number four. 
What's from Jonathan? Hello, Jonathan. Are you there? Knock once. For... <laughs> I know you're there somewhere. So just say hello. It's coming of age. It's called The Nominal. Again, interesting title. Interesting title. The Nominal. Do I, would I pick that up? Yeah, actually, I would pick that up. The Nominal? Yeah. This is Jonathan's blurb. Mikey Roberts is a 14-year-old drug dealer. Estranged from his parents and the family home, he works for the volatile Tomo, running county lines. A man he owes money to. But when the latest job goes awry and Mikey is witness to a brutal murder, he recognises the futility of the situation, putting into action a plan he hopes will rid him of Tomo and the drug dealing world for good. Seeking revenge on those who hurt him in the process, seeking a return to what's left of his childhood. Mm. Serious. Um, about Jonathan. Well, I hope you're there. Give us a wave if you are. Uh, studied civil engineering at Manchester University. Worked in finance and IT since university. Currently a solutions engineer for a global law firm. I live in Saddleworth near Oldham and enjoy films, Britpop era music, <laughs> uh, playing cricket and watching my beloved Manchester City. That's a full time job. Um, I've enjoyed creative writing since my early teens and read predominantly literary contemporary fiction. My preferred authors include J.G. Ballard, Cormac McCarthy, Martin Amis, R.I.P. and Dom DeLillo. I think all that sounds fine, but I think what will sound even finer <laughs> because we only just got this in, actually, just a few minutes ago, is this wonderful reading from someone we don't hear enough from. It's Kay. The Nominal by Jonathan Walmsley, read by Kay. Drugs make the world go round, for some boys and girls at least, round and round, along Branch Line and B Road, from alleyway to public toilet cubicle, trap house to downtrodden seaside resort, like the place we're in now. Some village train station, anonymous as the rest, that I'd never have known the universe had time for if it wasn't for the business I'm in. Drugs. The nationwide distribution of. But it's why I'm here, if you're interested. For a real world education. It's what every growing boy needs. Going OT is double the fun with a companion, but unfortunately for me, Dom isn't the most natural of conversationalists. I can see he's sizzling right now from the effects of the fentanyl patch attached to his arm, like a slab of meat on a summer barbecue being seized by the heat of its own juices. We're maybe an hour away from Manchester City Centre and I know it'll be a ball eight getting Dom onto the train that now approaches, but what help do I really want? A teenage kid with my crossbody hip bag full of drug money and my dope friend, who somewhere inside the catacombs of his huge park a coat harbours his own personal repository of illegal sweeties. Dom. I kick him harder than I intend to. We miss this train and Tomo will go ape shit. Get up. Get up. I mean it. Tomo likes to keep a tight ship. You ask him, he'll tell you. Dom. I swear down I'm getting on this fucking train no matter what, if you're with me or not. Leaving the frost of my false promise to settle in Dom's drowsy conscience, I survey the platform in both directions. The train has come to a full stop and the driver has dropped down from his cabin for a cigarette. A display unit above his head exhibits the departure time. Three minutes until launch. At the other end of the two-carriage train is the conductor. In a minute she'll signal to the driver, all's well, and then my teenage angst will hit some sort of crescendo. Dom! I look around accusingly. It's situations like this you need someone else to blame. This particular middle of nowhere is called Greenfield, if you're interested. A pretty configuration of stone walls and tall green trees, lavender hills dreaming distantly in the warmth of a summer-like day that has trespassed into early March. All I know is, this isn't where we should be. All I know is, we have to leave. Keep to the schedule. Not upset the rhythms of the Tomo Bayless drug empire. Back at Leeds, I'd argued with Dom we could get a train directly to Manchester, but he'd refused to wait. Before we'd worked out our platform, he'd suspiciously taken leave for the toilets and come back five minutes later appearing slightly subdued. 
I knew then I'd been abandoned for the journey home, but our dome has one main aim in life, to find a quiet, comfortable place to appreciate the neat little tricks of whatever he's got circulating in his bloodstream. He got on the train before I could remonstrate, and that was us condemned to the roundabout route. I'm just grateful I got him off here before changing trains had become an impossibility and the schedule was all but done for. Determined to make the train, I hooked Dom under an arm and yanked him forward like a farmer with a particularly belligerent member of livestock. The muscles in his neck collapse in unison. His preposterous, lanky frame follows. Earthbound. Down, down, Dom. You bring me down. I can see his brain has declared a state of inertia and the message distributed amongst all regions of his anatomy. He hangs on me sticking his head above the unconscious parapet to see if the war is won. I can see his eyes no longer remain in orbit, that they have veered off into some remote territory, some chemical new frontier. Mate, come on, we have to go! He shakes his head, eyes shattered glass. I know now we won't be making this train. Okay, so <laughs> quite a lot of thumps and bangs at the end there. That will be corrected by me later tonight, coding all night. Um, so, dear, oh dear. Let's, I just can't, what we've done, as you might have noticed, actually, is we've reduced the number of submissions on the show from five to four to make it more manageable. And believe me, that tiny little change has involved so, so much heartache behind the scenes. And clearly it's not quite working. It will be my next week. Pamela J says, wham, bam, that's a blurb. And that's, that's enthusiastic, isn't it, for PJ? David Guy says, title sounds like the peripheral. Blurb works for me, says James. And Clark Chandra Jill says, excellent blurb. Title doesn't work for me. Um, and David uh, says, because uh, Mike is witness to a brutal murder, David comments quite uh, astutely, I think, um, as opposed to a gentle and fluffy murder, perhaps. Um, Johnny says, I do think uh, any author calling their work literary, this is apropos previous submission, is putting themselves under unnecessary pressure. Hello, Tim. Jonathan Wright, but I need a reason to want to spend time with this character. Yes, absolutely. Within the first couple of paragraphs, absolutely. And I think you'll find those comments echoed in the uh, genius room. Blurb's almost there, says Matt. Lex says, Blurb needs some minor tweaking, but gives a, a sympathetic anti-hero protagonist we already want to root for. Let's go. Um, very on point for today's problem, says Hannah. This should have commercial appeal. And Matt says, cue, cue the for some girls and boys at least, make the case without waffling. Good voice here, says Hannah. Great writing, says Annie. Uh, but agree with Claire. Sounds like an adult. And Claire actually said, yeah, I like the voice, but it's not a 14-year-old's. Hmm. Annie. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's really confident writing. It gave a very clear idea of, you know, the problem, the main character, you know, his reactions, etc. cetera. Um, I think the, the comment, if you're interested, actually almost ask the reader to come back to think, well, am I? You know, so I think that may, that may be an accident. Um, yeah. I, I like the clear, forceful drive, you know, the short sentences, you know, we did feel we were kind of banging along, as it were, um, but and, and it gave a sense of, of urgency of a situation brewing and, and bad things happening. Um, yeah. But the chatty tone, I thought, you know, to get that balance between this sort of sense of urgency and sense of menace and sense of really dreadful things happening, mm. you know, with the chatty tone, I thought that was done very well. Yeah. Um, 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 uh, there was some lovely phrases. There was something about uh, a place that the universe had forgotten or, you know, that you didn't, I, I can't quite remember how they put it, um, or that the universe had time for. Mm -hmm. um, and also like that one sentence when the, the boy was going down, it, literally the one word, earthbound. I yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but equally, there was, um, there was something about a particularly belligerent member of, of livestock. You know, we just don't need a long and clumsy phrase. You know, well, it's not a 14-year-old, is it? No, it's, mm. yeah, we just need something kind of, you know, snappy. And, and so we need to tidy it up to the level of, of the, the good phrases, as it were. Um, so, oh yeah, there was a summer-like day that had been transposed into early March. Nice concept, but again, do we, you know, it's quite sort of clumsy phrasing. Um, so I thought at the beginning that the pacing was very good. You know, we were being taken somewhere and then we just mm. sagged. That entire paragraph back at Leeds, why, you know, yeah. Dom, they're going on the train on. Why? You know, do we yeah. need to know any of that? And no, yeah. that literally, a line could go through that without any loss at all. Um, so I think, 
a bit of a bit of sorting out, a bit of yes. debugging. Dang, Gardner, you're good. <laughs> I don't know anything else. That. I can't, can't say anything else. But the genius room will. Uh, wow, says Matt K. Fantastic reading. K only does fantastic readings. What we need is more. That's the only problem. We need more readings from K. Hannah says this writing is drawing me in. Very train spotting. I wrote down train spotting straight away as well. It's many generations old now. We need a modern train spotting. Maybe this is it. And he says, might work better if you establish the narrator as the adult version of the character looking back. If not, sounds a bit too old. That's the solution to the problem that a lot of us are picking up here. That is, at the very least, uneven language. It doesn't honestly doesn't feel like a 14-year-old. Um, Palmer Joe, pacing dialogue spot on, pulling the reader into the scene and story. Claire says, great craft, gritty. Train spotting again. Train spotting is mentioned again. Meets county line. Yeah. And James says, this is coming of age. Boy, did I have a normal childhood. Hmm. Lee. Yeah. Um, I liked the blurb too. I think it needs a little bit of tweaking, but I, I agree that the blurb was really tight and does ex does tell us exactly what the story is about. Um, I love the opening line, drugs make the world go round. I mean, that just mm. gives us a very, you know, a very quick uh, jump into, the, into yeah. the story. The voice is great, I, but there are some moments where the menace is just really clear. I think Kay was spot on there. Um, I'm not sure about this fourth wall, you know, if you're interested. who Who's this mm. person talking to? So that kind of intrigued me, and I'm not entirely sure I like that distance for especially for a story like this where there is so much threat and menace i think you need to be in the head of the character and not necessarily distancing it and uh, uh, you know telling it from from you know to somebody like that i think we want to be in the character's head um and i agree with what ali was saying about debulking and the issue is these kind of authorial um, sort of purple sentences, you know, um, and one of the, the, I wrote down the frost of false promise, um, you know, a 14-year-old, even a 14-year-old who's been involved in the drug world and obviously pretty worldly wise is probably not going to use that turn of phrase. So mm. it's just, deep, it's taking, it's taking you out of the story, Jonathan, and just putting that character in. So anything that's you talking, take it out take it out yeah. um and so uh, yeah it, it ha you have to get yourself into the head of that character and only be that character what do you and, think about and um, uh, take jonathan out lee what do you think about annie's suggestion of um having this uh, having this narrator's voice an adult but looking back do you think that would that would work uh, yeah it might except for i don't know that ya readers want to read what an adult thinks i'm I not think sure this is ya this the one the the oh, genre that Jonathan said is coming of age. of age, so that could, I don't know what that is really. Yeah, with a teen protagonist, I think that might be YA. So, yeah, um, could be. That, sorry, yeah. that was how I read it. So yeah. maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. I know a lot of adults read YA, so yeah. um, this, this the, there is a place for that. But I do feel you, we I think those readers want to they read it because they want to be in the head of someone yes. young. And, yes. and feel it from their experience. So you're distancing the story if you, first of all, use a fourth wall, and secondly, um, yeah, if you tell it, from, if, you know, in the past, mm. you know, if they've survived, basically, if you're telling it as an yeah. adult looking yeah. back. Yeah, good, okay. So the stakes uh, are gone. What did you say? The stakes are gone. The stakes are gone. If oh, they, <laughs> yeah, the stakes. The stakes are gone. The stakes are gone. Okay, the stakes are gone. Okay, yes. <laughs> Sorry, Kiwi yes, accent. because I, I, I listen with an English accent. That's the problem with me. Uh, <laughs> Matt says it's tough. It's tough to tell because Kay's reading is so good. But yeah, I feel a really good. strong voice. Um, Hannah says, I know 17-year-olds who are talking like this. Hannah says, I think you can definitely write about 14-year-old drug dealers. I think so too. Right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And he says, I'd believe him if he was 17, Hannah. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. David says, yeah, Hannah's right. It may be, it's maybe not a 14-year-old, but a plausible teenager using inflated language for humorous effect. Yeah, actually. Oh, well, yeah, Mark Twain did that a bit. Uh, Matt says, I grew up with the 14-year-old drug dealers. <laughs> Heck, 12-year-old drug dealers. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Lex quotes uh, from uh, your piece, Jonathan. I can see his brain has declared a state of inertia. Love it, he says. Good writing and voice, says Johnny. Um, this is 21st century. Um, 
artful dodger voice it is isn't it actually i think very commercial i think it could be too i mean there is an issue there that everyone's everyone's picking up at the moment actually jonathan so i think that's got to be resolved one way or another matt says this is strong writing gritty but felt real uh, and he continues to say also hire k for the audiobook yeah actually which you can do in fact can't you there you go mm. voice.litopia.com and you can you can actually do that let's look at the numbers wow that's good 72 that's uh, way ahead of everything else we've had uh so far good though it was um let's just look at the numbers there for a moment yeah you like the title the eh? craft is good yeah i think everyone's pretty much uh, I, I, all three of us have, have given 80 for the craft and the junior has, has given 75 which is within a hair's breadth so what that means I'm kind of nervous to push this button, actually. Just hopefully it's going to work. Let's look at the score so far. <laughs> yes. yes, there you go. It's, it's, it's very clear, actually. You're ahead on all four categories, except, actually, for the blurb, which Marie wins quite convincingly. Congratulations, Marie, for that. But... <laughs> Well done, Jonathan. You are our winner this week with a most impressive 72 marks. That is going to take some beating. We got it through to the end of a show that I'm going to describe as technically challenging today. But we did get through <laughs> it eventually after some electronic farts and heaven knows what else. So, you know, the gods were with us today. How I'm still, you know, just basking in the reflected glory of your of your continuing success, actually, Lee. It's so nice, isn't it, just to to be acknowledged like that. And um, when I haven't, I don't even like to ask you how many other awards you've won because we always get it wrong. Actually, let's 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 look at this. Actually, it's, here we go. No, where is it? Yeah, I wasn't ready, but here we go. Um, Look at all these amazing achievements. Um, how many uh, Bram Stoker? <laughs> we've got four. Is that accurate or not? That's that's accurate. Um, but fingers crossed, I'm heading to StokerCon next week and Stoker I'm Con. up for another one. So, <laughs> yes. Oh, StokerCon, yeah. yes. Well, you'll probably yes, be Stoker laid Con. down. Impossible to come home, actually. <laughs> what you got? Yeah, brilliant. That's great, and, no, and nobody, uh, nobody nicer to win them actually. And such a, such an unassuming person. You give so freely of your time to to uh, writers, not quite as oh, far along you. the uh, the trail as you are. Thank you for being with us today, Ali. Thank you for being with us today, <laughs> Lee. Thank you for being with us in the Genius Room and everyone else live on YouTube. Thank you for putting up with a few technical issues, which will be ironed out. Fingers crossed. Before we see you again, same time next week.